Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. A very warm welcome to you all, colleagues, family, friends, and uh, more the public community who have come to join us for this fantastic event tonight. Um, as you know, this is the inaugural lecture by Professor Nicholas Gollich. Um, from now onwards, I'm going to call him Nick, if you don't mind. And um, this is a recognition of what Nick has done in Antarctic Research Center uh, for us at Teheranga Wanka, Waka Uni Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, my name is Esan Mespahi. I'm uh, currently Pro Vice Chancellor for Faculties of Science, Health, Engineering, Architecture, and Design Innovation at University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all here uh, for this lecture. Um, Nick has been a member of our academic community since 2009, and he joined Antarctic Research Center as a postdoctoral research fellow, and his job was to examine and model the Antarctic ice sheet at that time. Uh, during this time, Nick's uh, prolific works made global societal environmental impact. He focused on the future of the Antarctic under climate change uh, and try to quantify the likely magnitude of ice sheet loss and how this will contribute to our rising seas. And I don't think I need to stress how important it is for us all now to see how this is going to continue and be important for the environment. His findings have contributed directly to reports from Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, the most recent of which Nick was a lead author on the work that sets the framework for environmental decision making by governments around the world, uh, informing many mitigations and adaptation measures. Additionally, he has been invited to contribute to a number of international projects, uh, including modeling of the Antarctic response. Closer to home, uh, Nick has developed working relationships with policymakers and ministers, including the Minister for Climate Change, the Honorable James Shaw, hosting him at the ARC and being hosted at Bowden House, delivering the latest from the ice sheets directly to the minister himself. He has engaged with the Minister for the Environment, the Honorable David Parker, and both the current and former Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. He communicates his findings and disseminates them directly to the public too, and is passionate about engaging with media at national and international levels and he equips the public with the information they need to take action in their own way against climate change. For his prolific portfolio of research, Nick has been well deservedly accoladed. He has been awarded the Mackay Hammer Award by the Geosciences Society of New Zealand, the Hill Tinsley Medal by the New Zealand Association of Scientists, and a Research Excellence Award from the University. He was a key member of the team awarded the 2019 Prime Minister's Science Prize and the Science New Zealand National Award. And most recently, the Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity as part of his work with IPCC. On top of all this, Nick continues to make and maintain time to allocate to teaching, and supervising more than a dozen postgraduate students over the last 14 years, and currently leading a group of postdoctoral researchers who are trying to follow his footsteps. I don't know whether it's difficult or easy, and I hope that many of them are in the audience today now. This willingness to engage in developing new talents and skills for the future has been always greatly appreciated by the faculty and myself and university. Tonight we have the pleasure of hearing and learning from Nick as he discusses in his inaugural lecture how processes of self-organization enable complexity and despite the laws of physics dictating that chaos and not order 
should increase over time in our natural world, the opposite also rings true. To this end, he will examine the patterns of behavior that many natural systems share, from plate tectonics to ecological biodiversity, the global climate to the beating of our hearts as we search for nature's invisible hand. Nakute honore ki te fakaato i enei ahorangi Nicolas Cage. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to the audience tonight. Please join the podium. Tenakwe, Professor Mizbahi. Tenakoto, 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 Katoa. Kone College Takuengwa. He ahorangi aho, i te harangawaka, e um, te puna uh, pati, uh, patio tio. Now mai, now mai, now mai hare mai. A uh, very warm welcome to you all this evening. It's great to see so many people here. Um, and lots of familiar faces, lots of unfamiliar faces. So it's, uh, it's a, nice, a nice mix. Certainly a real privilege to be here to give this talk um, and to share with you uh, some of the things that interest me. Um, we're not going to talk about Antarctica a whole lot, but uh, there's lots of other things we'll, we'll cover. Uh, it's a particular delight for me this evening that my family are here. Um, I don't often get to share what I do um, with, with, uh, with my family. They don't get to see me in a work context very much. So it's great that they could be here uh, tonight. Um, so if I have one kind of aim for this evening... Um, it's not only to interest you all in what I'm doing, but uh, to try and avoid this sort of um, situation. <coughs> so it's a humble aim. Uh, I've got 45 minutes to uh, get through this, and um, <clears throat> we'll see where we end up on the other side. So my career, I've been uh, doing kind of earth science and so on for about 26 years. And over that time, I've probably given uh, quite a lot of talks. I haven't counted them, but I'm guessing it's probably been a few hundred. Um, and nearly all of those talks have been about mud, rocks, ice, climate, something like that. But tonight, I wanted to talk about something different. I wanted to talk about life. And we'll get to the climate and possibly the mud. Now, life, of course, is a concept we're all familiar with. Um, if you're not, then <clears throat> something to watch for. <laughs> but it's a really difficult thing to try and define. And if we do try and define it, actually, most of the time, what we end up doing is just describing it. We, we end up describing um, sort of characteristics of life, uh, signatures of life. It's quite an easy thing to describe, but not an easy thing to define. And it gets more difficult if we try and quantify life. So if we actually try and uh, put numbers to, to what life is, um, it, it, it's quite a tricky thing. Now, I like this because it means we've got lots of latitude to play around with some ideas, and it, it gives us some, um, some scope for thinking about um, interesting things. But I think for many of us, um, as, as, as humans, as, as um, mammals, one of the most emblematic things when we think about life is to think about the heart, uh, a beating heart. So I have a video here. Um, it's of a beating heart. If you um, are going to be a little sensitive to that, feel free to, to look away. It's only about 30 seconds long. Um, I'll tell you when it's, when it's finished. Um, but it's an interesting one. So here we have the emblem of life. We have a heart beating. But this heart isn't where it should be, right? It's not in our body. It's in a plastic box. So we have to sort of... I'll finish the video, though. It's basically just more of the same. Um, <laughs> as you would expect, right? So we have this, this, this kind of slightly strange paradox. Right? We have a heart that's beating, but it's not in a body. So where does the life reside? Does the life reside in the body? Uh, does it re reside in the heart? Does it reside uh, maybe in the cells of the heart? So we have this sort of 
the, the, this possibility that life can reside in different places. And this is a little bit of a, a sort of contrived um, philosophical di digression, but it, it's worth exploring this because what I'm getting at here is what I've put here in the, in the title, that life doesn't really reside in any one place like that. The life that we, that we describe, that we try and sort of measure or try and understand, is an emergent product, right? It's an emergent phenomenon. It's something that comes from the totality of all these individual things. Just um, we, we, we could say that certain cells are alive, and, and, and that would be true, but it's really um, the cells working in the heart and the heart being in the body with all the other parts of us that, that makes us alive. So we can see that the heart is uh, part of a much bigger system. And that's kind of really what I wanted to get at with that example. Now, I said that life was difficult to quantify, but we can measure signatures of, of life. So this graph here um, is just showing you the... Uh, basically, it's a measure of the electrical current in a cluster of cells in the sinoatrial node. So this is in the upper right atrium of the heart. This is basically what, what's known as the pacemaker uh, of, of the heart, the pacemaker cells. Now, you don't need too much of a background in, in heart physiology to sort of be able to see that this is um, quite a distinctive waveform. Okay, so what we're seeing here is one aspect of a heartbeat, and it's characterized by, um, hopefully you can see the colored bars uh, in the background. We see the green bar there is marking the peak of each of these waves. And then we see a period of rapid uh, drop, in this case, the gray bar. Uh, and then the blue shows a period where um, the, the charge, in this case, is declining more slowly. And then the, the ready brown bar shows when it, it bounces back up. And that, that sort of pattern repeats over and over again. And we can simulate that quite easily with um, a very simple model. Okay, So we can take a simple equation. We can simulate that behavior. Now, what we're not doing is we're not simulating the processes in the heart. What we're doing is we're saying, can we simulate a waveform? This is just purely a mathematical equation that just gives us a waveform. Now, that's important because, you know, this is a distinctive waveform. It's not like the sinusoidal pattern that you would expect from the, you know, the rise and fall of the, the, the daily tides um, or the rise and setting of the sun, which would follow a very smooth peak and decline. This is a very asymmetric waveform, right? So it's a very abrupt rise, and then a, a steep drop, a slower drop, and then another very abrupt rise. It's an asymmetric wave, and we'll come back to that throughout this, this, this talk. Okay, so we've got a model. We've got um, a simple mathematical approximation of that behavior, and that's all we're trying to do, just get an approximation of the behavior. Now, that is evolving over several hundred milliseconds, but we can take the exact same... Uh, calculation, and we can allow it to evolve over hundreds of thousands of years. And we can add noise to the system. We can add natural variability to it. So we can simulate um, what would happen in a, in a system that's maybe less well constrained than the heart, something that's uh, like the global climate that is affected by many, many other things. So we can see we've got the same asymmetric waveform here. It's evolving over hundreds of thousands of years. And if we compare that to something like the ice core records that tell us uh, about global air temperature, we can see that it captures the same basic shape. It doesn't capture all the variability because it's not intended to. It's too simple to do that. But it's capturing the same basic shape. And we can go a step further because we can actually look at how something like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has changed over the last 500 million years. And again, we can apply the same model and drop that on and say there's pretty good correspondence. Now, the point of showing this isn't um, to suggest that these different aspects of, um, of the climate behave in exactly the same way as the heart. Uh, of course, there are very different things controlling them all. But the point is to say that the heart is a very easy system to, to measure and model, and we can understand it by putting it in a box and prodding and poking and doing all sorts of things to it. We can't do that with the climate system. It evolves over a much too greater scale uh, in, in, in space, but also in time. We can't sit there and measure it and, and so on for hundreds of thousands of years. So by translating the behavior of something that we can understand very easily, onto something that's very hard to understand, we can learn something about the dynamics uh, of that system. 
So to that end, we can look at how um, a heart works. And I've sort of called it a leaky bucket here. It's not suggesting that the heart is leaking. That would be, uh, that would be a problem. Um, but it's coming back to these sinoatrial node cells. Apparently, if you take the cells out of the heart, those particular cells, you can put them in a Petri dish and they'll still generate, spontaneously generate this charge. But the thing is, if all those cells just generated a charge, a little pulse of electricity, kind of randomly, then they wouldn't trigger this, this um, effective uh, pulse of the heart. They wouldn't be able to coordinate themselves um, to, to, to sort of produce a single pulse of, of energy. So what happens is that as they generate this charge, they build up their, their total charge kind of s rapidly to start with, and then at the rate slows down. It's a bit like charging a, a battery. Um, anyone with an electric car will know the, the problem of charging very quickly to start with. You hit 80% and then all of a sudden it takes forever. It's very much the same with these, these, um, these heart cells. So they're charging up and then they go through this period where they're, they're, they're slowing down. Now the value in that is that it allows neighboring cells who are maybe on a slightly different schedule, it allows them to catch up. Now bit by bit, this allows the whole cluster of tens of thousands of cells to get to the same critical state because what's happening is that once the charge reaches a threshold, it's triggered to release that, that charge. Now if one cell releases the charge and the others aren't ready, it, it just fizzles out, it doesn't go anywhere. What we need is a sustained reaction, kind of like when a nuclear reactor reaches that point of criticality where it propagates uh, a change from, from one thing to the next. So that's what we're looking for here, and that's what the heart does. It reaches this critical state by allowing others to catch up. And by doing that, it entrains the entire body. And from that point on, those cells are then synchronized, and they can produce this coherent uh, pulse. So waiting is very, very useful. So I've got a, another animation here. This is, um, this is a simple system. That, okay, so this is... Um, what we call a sand pile model, but it's a, it's a, a computer version of a sand pile model. So imagine you have a, a traditional hourglass full of sand and you tip it upside down and you watch the sand running out of the middle and it's piling up sand underneath. And as that sand pile gets bigger and bigger, it then collapses, it avalanches because it gets unstable. So that's what we're doing here with this, with this, um, with this model. And you'll see when I play it, um, uh, what happens. Now, the, the thing to bear in mind, before I start this, the thing to bear in mind is that all we're doing in this is we're adding one grain of sand, one digital grain of sand, to the very central cell in this grid, so the very central point, and we're doing that over and over again, but we're doing it at exactly the same time. We're doing it one, uh, one grain every time step, and we run it for 10,000 time steps. So it's a very linear, predictable input. Now, what you see here is that the, the, the sand pile is growing quite quickly to start with because we're adding material to the, to the central cell. And as it builds up to a threshold and we allow it to collapse, then it spreads to the neighboring cells. And then, of course, as they build up, then they collapse and they spread to the neighboring cells. And so over time, it very quickly sort of spreads out. You can imagine this is kind of like the way that a, a lichen grows on a rock or something like that. Now, the colors of this are basically showing you the heights of the, um, that pile of sand grains. So as it gets bigger, uh, we have a different color from when it's, uh, when it's, when it's much lower. Now, because it's a, a very geometric and regular um, model, it's producing very pretty shapes to look at. But what you're also seeing is these waves of uh, restructuring. And what you're hopefully beginning to see now is this system is getting more complicated you're seeing these waves of uh, reorganization sweeping across the domain. Now, as we let this run, uh, I won't let it run for too long because it goes on for quite a while. <laughs> um, but as we watch this, the state of complexity of this system is always increasing, all right? Because we're always adding more material. And so that gives the system more possibilities, more opportunities. And so the complexity of the system is increasing and the reorganizations that take place are also getting more complex. We, we eventually get to a point where the, the reorganizations kind of sweep backwards and forwards across the, the whole system. But the other thing to notice is that the time between those reorganizations is also increasing. So we, that was a really good one. Um, we see lots of little kind of collapse events, but we don't see that many big collapse events. 
And that's quite an interesting, um, an interesting thing. So we could talk about behavior, um, but the physicists won't, won't let us. We have to talk about um, uh, uh, structural dynamics, I think, because this isn't behavior as such. Let's just, let's just stop that. Now, from that simulation, from that model, all I've done here is I've taken the average of those heights, the things that were shown in the, in the colors. Every cell that had digital sound in it, I've taken the height of those cells and I've averaged them. And that's what this green line shows. So on the top panel here, we're seeing the whole evolution of that system, over 10,000 steps. Now, to start with, you can see there's lots of variability in that average because it's building up. There's only a few cells to start with, so it builds up and then it collapses. It builds up collapses. Lots of variability over a short period of time. And that's what gives us panel B underneath, a very symmetric or near-symmetric oscillation. Okay? So there's very few parts in the system at this point, and they build up and then they collapse. But as time goes on, as the complexity of the system increases, we start getting a more asymmetric waveform. And by the end, we've got a very asymmetric waveform. Now, this is reminiscent, of course, what we saw in the climate records, what we saw in the heart behavior. It doesn't really matter that these waves are going up rather than down. It just depends on whether you're looking at the, the forcing or the response. But the, the key point here is that it's asymmetric. That's all I want to really sort of get across here. Now, when we think about the way natural systems work, um, <coughs> We're not working in a void. People have been trying to figure this stuff out for a remarkably long time. Um, one of my favorite people is Fritjof Capra. He, he's a physicist who's written um, a lot of books over the years. He's, he's quite elderly now. Um, he's written a, an amazing number of books that all have tremendous insight. Um, but in one of them, he, he sort of tries to break down natural systems and um, not just living systems, but any system really, into these three things. He has sort of process, form, and matter. <laughs> And he says, as long as you've got those three constituents, you can have a, a system that, that works, that does something. And so he sort of describes these, um, these different components. Um, he, he talks about matter. Um, you've got to have a, a material in this system that allows energy to flow through it. It has to be a dissipative uh, material. And that allows the system to evolve to a point that is far from equilibrium. So this is something that um, is maybe distinct from... Um, you know, if you think of like the Gaia hypothesis of James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis in the 1970s, um, published the year I was born, actually. Um, now, they were arguing for stability, and homeostasis was actually a word that they used. But this is a, a system that's quite different. It's actually saying these things are being pushed away from what they want to be. They're not trying to find balance. They're, they're, they're trying to find a state that is um, maybe a steady state, but it's far from, from equilibrium. And through doing that, this system uses that energy to organize itself in a way that can affect structural change. And he refers to this as a, a cognitive cycle. He talks about this sort of cognitive process, and cognitive adaptation. So it's not the same as consciousness. He's not arguing for, uh, for that. He's basically saying this is a learning process. Now, um, sort of a you know, decade or more later, um, Jeremy England came along and... Um, came up with a very similar sort of idea, uh, but he, he didn't really mention Capra at all. But it, the difference with England's work, he was coming at it from a nanotechnology perspective. Um, he's now head of AI at GlaxoSmithKline, so he's, he's, um, he's a pretty smart cookie. Um, but what he did was he, he sort of organized this system into, into a, a distinct sort of process. So he turned this sort of triangle into a, into a, into a triangular circle, let's say. But the way he imagined it was that all these systems rely on a drive of energy, right? So you put a drive of energy into a system, and then it flows through the system. It has to be dissipated. And the way that the material and the structure uh, of that system use the energy uh, is basically affected by and goes on to affect the, the, the efficiency of the system as a whole. So it's using a drive of energy to change its form. And by doing that, it aligns itself better with that flow of energy. Now, that all sounds a bit too confusing. Um, I've got one more video. Um, this one I, is one of my favorites. It's, it's pretty short. Um, but it really captures the essence of what you can do with a simple drive. Okay, So by drive, we mean uh, flow of energy. Now, what you're going to see in this video 
or being well, is a flow of energy that goes from um, the ring electrode, uh, which is this thing coming down from the, the, the top of the screen. Sorry, that, that's the source electrode. Um, so that's kind of suspended above this dish. And in the Petri dish, we've got a ring electrode around the, around the bottom. So it's just a metal ring. Now, those two aren't physically connected, of course. Um, the electricity that's being pushed into that source electrode has to jump through the air to get to that ring electrode. And what it does is quite interesting. This, um, the power going into this source electrode increases from 0 to 30,000 volts. So they're not messing around. And you'll see, gradually, these ball bearings are now beginning to move. They're in some sort of viscous oil, and they began to move around. They're, they're responding to that um, electromagnetic field, essentially, in the air. Now, gradually, as they move, they're affecting, they're influencing the, uh, the electrical field in the air around them. So the ball bearings next to them are also influenced by that. So gradually, bit by bit, they actually affect them, each other in such a way as they organize themselves into a straight line. But then if you watch very closely, something kind of cool happens because they don't just sit there. Isn't that cool? And it doesn't stop. It's just, it just keeps moving. It, 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 it finds this beautiful arrangement where it can tap into that flow of energy, that flow of electricity, but it carries on moving. It's continually seeking some sort of um, improvement. It's looking for other, um, other ways that it can improve its efficiency. And the authors of this paper note that it, 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 it develops what they refer to as lifelike structure or lifelike behavior. In fact, they do other experiments where they break these, um, these trees into pieces and they actually reform. So they talk about this healing process. So this, to me, is a perfect example of having a very, very simple system. It couldn't get much more simple. And yet it develops behaviors that are lifelike. So it comes back to how we started this, this talk, thinking about what really is life. Is life this dual thing? Is it this binary state of, of living and not living? Or is it actually a continuum where we have something that can go from being non-living to then developing life-like behaviors and then becoming maybe minimally living and then fully living? That's an interesting question to ponder. Um, but it, it, it makes you wonder, you know, if, if the world was just full of ball bearings and you had electric fields all over the place, you could probably develop um, some very complex interactions, just like we saw in the, in the Sandpile model. So when we think about life, we have to sort of reframe our expectations and think, well, life and lifelike behavior aren't just about things that we say are biological. There can be lifelike behaviors in many different things. And trying to find the point at which they become living becomes even harder to, to decide than it was when we started. But I think there are sort of three components that we can identify that all living systems have. So these would be the things that a system might aspire to have, if you like. And everyone from Darwin to Dawkins has come up with um, some sort of form of these. But essentially, we need to have some sort of uh, memory. We need to have some way of retaining what's happened before. And so in, in many cases, you could say that whatever the shape or structure of a system uh, at the point you observe it, that is its memory of what's happened to it before. It's encoded in its, in its form. Now, as that undergoes changes and is uh, exposed to other influences, it needs to have a way to lock in the changes that are advantageous. Okay? So we need to have some irreversibility in the process. And once we've done that, we then have something that's different from what we started with. So we, we, then we have the option that we can assemble it. We can combine it with different permutations. So we're combining innovations. And so by going through this process where we have these three components, we can build a living system. And there's something else that I think sits behind all this. Essentially what's happening in all these things is that we're going from something that was essentially quite passive to start with to something that was much more active. Okay, we've gone from something that's just purely a structure that encodes memory of what happened previously towards something that is now assembling and trying to create something new. It's a very active kind of form. We're going from something that was simple to something that is much more complex. It's lots more moving parts, lots more uh, opportunities for innovation. And the reason I think that that's important is because the key thing for me about life is not so much the things that we measure. 
it's really about the fact that by becoming alive, we find agency, we have independence from the energy that is, is driving us. Okay, and that means that we are then separated in some way from the forces that are, are pushing on us. Okay, so if you're a, a rock in a river, you're just pushed on by the river, you go where the river wants you to go. But if you're um, a system that can store up energy over a period of time and build it up like those heart cells to a point where you can then release it all very quickly, you can do a lot more work. It's a lot more efficient. So it gives you this escape mechanism. So we've already seen the heart. We've already seen the global climate. What are the systems um, behave like this? Well, we could look at plate tectonics. We know that um, the early Earth, this is based on computer simulations, but um, essentially what's happening is that as the, as the plate uh, plate tectonic system developed, it became a self-organizing system. It uh, rotated in ways that followed this sort of sawtooth pattern. We can look at um, life on Earth. We can look at the way that species um, co-occurrence changed through time. And again, we follow the same sawtooth pattern. So these sawtooth patterns come up quite a lot. And they seem to reflect systems that build up slowly and then change suddenly. And that seems to be reflective of this idea of absorbing a drive of energy and then releasing it much more quickly. Now, the thing about life, um, we could see that sawtooth pattern over a geological time, but if we take a snapshot of life, in this case marine life, and we look at the way that it's distributed according to its, its range of sizes, we end up with something like this. This is um, a fairly colorful plot, but it's basically showing a straight line. Now, the caution here is that this is on two logarithmic axes rather than arithmetic axes, okay? So each major division on the horizontal and the vertical scale is 10 times the last one, okay? Now, we do this because it, it makes it uh, clearer to see these patterns. But what we're seeing here is the, the number of individuals within a particular class of sizes. And you can see that they follow this beautiful distribution across 25 orders of magnitude. This is what we refer to as scale invariance. This is a power, power law relationship. Now, the interesting thing about that is we see it in lots of other things. We see it in the way that earthquakes uh, are organized. We see it at the scale of um, the iron channels in uh, heart cells. All right? So the, the iron channels are what lets uh, calcium, um, sodium, potassium ions in and out of the cell membrane. We see it in the way that ice sheets flow, the way that climate changes. And we see it, of course, in, in brain activity. That's uh, well known um, uh, for, for dis, um, exhibiting these power law relationships. So, yeah, why is any of this important? Well, all, this, all these systems that are showing those power laws are organized. They're, they've basically developed some sort of hierarchy where there are lots of a very um, small entity and very few of a very large entity. And that suggests that there's some process, some invisible hand, if you like, that's organizing that system to that state. Why would it do that? Why, why does any of that matter? Well, the point is, when you have a system that is organized like that, it dissipates energy more efficiently. Okay? So it allows you to transmit information more effectively. So this is what's happening in the brain. The brain builds on the fly. It's continually building um, these, these um, scale invariant networks between neurons, and then they're collapsing through avalanches and rebuilding in another way. And it does that so that it can be at the edge of chaos or close to the edge of chaos as much of the time as possible because that's where uh, peak information flow occurs. And by doing that over and over again, we allow uh, ourselves to go through these restructuring cycles. So we're going through this cognitive cycle. We're going through a process of, of learning and adaptation. And it doesn't really matter where we look, um, whether it's in the, the, the neurons in the brain or in the electromagnetic um, energy in the cosmos. We see the same patterns of organization. And it all comes from this um, self-organization, the synchronization of individual elements. And it comes from waiting, memory, and irreversibility. Now, it's one thing to say, oh, well, everything in the natural world kind of follows these behaviors. <clears throat> what about us? We, we sort of perhaps a little arrogantly think that, you know, as humans, we've sort of detached ourselves, removed ourselves slightly from the natural order of things. <coughs> Maybe not so. You know, the way that we send emails follows what, what's called bursty behavior. 
I mean, we can all sympathize with that, right? You know, one day you're firing off hundreds, then it's weeks before you get right around to doing any more. But the way we compose music, patterns in music, are also um, correspond to these power law relationships. The way that we wage wars or drive our cars through the city, they all seem to follow these patterns. And it's not because we are individually trying to conform to a pattern. We're looking at the, st the statistics of the, the, the total population of these things. So something is producing these behaviors. And this nice paper from Barabasi suggests that it's a, a generic feature of, of human dynamics, something that's a consequence of queuing. So you can think again about that waiting concept. Now, these days, you can't go anywhere without hearing about uh, large language models and chat GPT. So I thought I'd throw in this example because language follows the same thing. If you rank the occurrence of words and the number of times that might occur in a document, you see a power law relationship. And this is exactly how things like chat GPT work. They, they build sentences incrementally saying, well, what is the most likely word to come after this word? Let's look at billions of documents and rank the, number of, uh, rank the words, count the number of them, and then say, well, this one is the most likely one to follow. But they don't just stop at that. They add a bit of randomness because, obviously, if you just took the top pick, you know, your top hit on the Google search, it's not necessarily always going to be uh, very interesting. You might end up in the same place over and over again. It gets a bit formulaic. So what ChatGPT and other models are doing is that they're adding a random element. So they're saying, well, let's have a look at maybe the third one or the fifth one. And we can change that. We can change how much randomness we put in there. But the point of showing this is that when we have a system that is well organized like this, and we can understand the statistics of the system, it allows us this possibility of prediction. And I think that's a key thing. OK, so we're going to extend. We're almost, um, almost going to wrap this up. But we're going to extend into one other realm of these, um, these organizing systems. Because the key thing about a lot of these systems, again, we can see that power law relationship there on the left-hand side. But this is coming from a network. In this case, this is a network of artists. Okay, so these are famous artists and their students who have also then gone on to be famous artists or maybe less famous artists um, and then had more students and, and so on. So you can see the artists like Rembrandt, a uh, very big node there, big blob of yellow, uh, lots of students, of course, and many of them went on to be great artists in their own right. So we can build networks of almost anything. Of course, the Internet is a great example. We see nodes that have uh, connections to other nodes, and those edges, those, those connections, uh, define the structure of that network. Now, the interesting thing is that once we sort of appreciate that, we can see that actually the, the behavior of that network, the behavior of a system, relies on the way those nodes and, and edges are, are, are sort of organized. And so we can use that. We can restructure a network to effect change if we know what we're doing. So that last point there, the evolution of natural and social systems can be directed by the connections we make. So again, it comes back to this idea of agency, that if we understand the systems and we understand the connections, we can change how uh, things can evolve in the future. So this is my wrapping up now. This is my thesis, essentially, that through time and uh, growth of a system, we have increasing complexity. And the value of increasing complexity is that it allows a system to exhibit a decoupled response. It allows a system to de behave essentially independently of the driving force that's, that's pushing it. It relies on waiting, because without waiting, it's going to struggle to organize. And through waiting, we get synchronization. And through synchronization, we get a coordinated response, and that allows effective change. And all that relies on the network architecture. It relies on all the things being connected together. And changing that network, evolving that network, allows the system to evolve. So when we bring all that together and think about this invisible hand, that whatever it is, this, this magic something that sort of ties all these things together, we've got to think, well, we organize ourselves into networks. We do it all the time. Social networks, work networks. There's all manner of different networks. But we, we have the opportunity now to reflect on the way that we build those networks. And rather than doing it passively, saying, well, we're just part of a bigger system, we can actually do it more consciously and think, well, am I building the network that is most appropriate for the energy that's, um, that's flowing through it? 
if we're operating like all living systems in a state that is far from equilibrium, what does that mean in terms of our ability to adapt and change? Can we uh, rapidly change? I mean, th these systems that I've talked about are operating close to that edge of chaos. So they're operating at a point where they should be able to switch and change very, very quickly. Now, what is it in our human nature that stops us doing that when we know we need to? And what we do know from all these systems is that no matter what's happening, it's going to happen again. These systems go through cycles, repetitive cycles of restructuring and growth. But the key thing that I've underlined here is learning. We've got to learn from those, those uh, repeating cycles. So through all that, I would say that the way that these systems evolve, us included, it is a way that gives us agency, it gives us um, uh, an independence and a mechanism to basically choose our own destiny, if you want to see it that way. And we can do that because as hopefully intelligent, conscious beings, we have the ability to predict the future. We can look at the way other systems are working. We can look at systems maybe like the climate, maybe like biodiversity. We can see that they are restructuring right now. And we can say, well, is that a good thing? We can predict what's going to happen next. And the last one, their purpose. If we can see what's going to happen next, it means we have a purpose. We have a meaning. We have something to do. We have to decide consciously, is that what we want to happen? Or do we want maybe to try and uh, affect some other change? So... I hope you've enjoyed at least some of that. I hope it wasn't too esoteric. I do have a lot of thank yous. Um, thank you all for being here and, uh, and uh, coming along this evening to listen to this talk. Um, I want to thank Kylie, wherever she is, for organizing and doing all the, uh, the organization here this evening. Um, I'd like to thank Isan for um, supporting uh, myself in my own promotion application. Actually. <clears throat> two and a half years ago now. It's been a bit delayed because of, uh, because of COVID. Um, but uh, yeah, Isan's been a, a big supporter of um, everything we've done uh, in our group. So huge thank you there. Great to see so many friends and, and colleagues here. And I, I, um, I, I'm not going to name everybody at the Antarctic Research Center, but I do want to acknowledge that everyone there has been absolutely tremendous and a huge support uh, in, in my work over the 14 years that I've been there. It really is like a second family to me, and it's, it's really humbling for me when I go into work in the morning to be surrounded and continually reminded that I'm surrounded by people who are doing absolutely incredible work, um, not just in the, the sort of science that I'm familiar with, but in a lot of the scientific fields that I'm not familiar with, but also the professional staff, the engineering team, they're all doing incredible stuff. And, you know, I'm just uh, constantly in awe. And, of course, we sit in an ecosystem um, that is, also includes other departments in the university, other schools, other CRIs. There's a huge number of people involved in, in, in the work that we do. And, of course, we couldn't do any, any of it without the funding and logistics and all the support that we get from, from other places. Most of all, I have to thank these guys. <laughs> They're going to cringe at me putting this photo up. Um, but really, without them, none of this would happen. They're the ones that, that keep things going when the wheels fall off. They're the ones that pick me up when I need a bit of a boost. And uh, they're the reason that it all happens. So a huge thank you to them. And I hope that at the end of this, I haven't disgraced myself. <laughs> it's been a big concern. Um, if you're not familiar with this quote, um, the father in question was uh, a fairly well-known medical doctor. And he made a couple of important discoveries. But his son actually transformed the way that we understand science. So he didn't do too badly after all. <laughs> OK, so that's all from me. I hope those of you that came for the science uh, didn't feel like there was too much philosophy in there. I hope if you came for the philosophy, you didn't feel there was too much science. If you just came for the free drinks, then you don't have too long to wait, because they'll be <laughs> coming up soon. Um, but no matter what you came for, thank you, and um, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you, if you have enjoyed it and you want to read more, 
there's a book <laughs> coming out soon uh, in a few months' time. Um, so please jump onto your favourite internet uh, <clears throat> book agent and uh, put in a pre-order if you want to. Feel free to grab me for questions afterwards. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, tina koto, tina koto, tina tato kato. Um, I'm Rob Mackay. I'm the director of Tipuna Patiotia, the Antarctic Research Centre, and it's my honour and privilege to give a vote of thanks to Nick for that that talk. It was. Um, I've got wonderful here, but it was really quite incredible, to be honest. Um, it wasn't what I expected. I had these notes given to me, and I was like, he does ice sheet modelling. Um, but he does a lot more modelling than that. So, um, yeah, just also just emphasise that Nick is a real leader in our group. Um, you know, he has been fundamental in developing a whole new ecosystem in the type of research that we've done in the Antarctic Research Centre. So, has revolutionised ice sheet modelling and has now developed this national modelling hub that includes researchers from all over Wellington as well as New Zealand, and that's in partnership with um, GNS Science and NIWA, who are um, important, important partners in the work we do. Our next work focuses primarily on understanding how the Earth system processes work, um, particularly in the context of climate change. So, um, you know, he has really fundamentally revolutionised our understanding of what the Antarctic ice sheet contributions will be to future sea level rise and is a globally, internationally recognised expert in this. Um, so not just New Zealand, but every country around the world that has an exposure to a coastline is it's really dependent on some of the fundamental work that he's doing to adapt to future climate change. So tonight, Nick um, threw a curveball in and described the ways that different systems work. Um, you know, both physical and biological, and how they all sort of display this really quite similar pattern of um, behaviour. Um, and so how can these easily observable systems um, teach us about you know, quite more complex systems? And um, yeah, it was very thought-provoking. Um, I have a few questions for you. Um, so these similarities between natural systems, you know, going from plate tectonics, biodiversity, global climate, and a beating heart in a box, um, you know, they really do allow us to understand the networks and systems that we're all part of and how they interact in surprisingly predictable ways. You know, by appreciating these roles that these processes play, we can more clearly see the consequences of any disruption to these systems, for example, the context of climate change and biodiversity. So we've only seen a glimpse tonight of what Professor Gollidge's passion for the intersection of science, philosophy and the arts are. This interdisciplinary approach is the kind of vision that, as a university, we really value. And, you know, I, I've got notes here to say I couldn't close without the book, but Nick sort of beat me to it. Um, so he's, he's really um, obviously interested in people buying it, but I think he's, <laughs> he's more interested really in how people relate to these ideas. I mean, this is, you know, something that I wasn't expecting to see tonight, and I probably have to read it three or four times over to really get the depth of level of understanding and thought that Nick's put into that. It's um, a very impressive piece of work. So, Nick, it's my pleasure to recognise you for what was a really fantastic lecture. And also just acknowledge your family as well. So, um, you know, it's not easy being married to a scientist that gets a little bit obsessed about um, ideas, and particularly around order and chaos, um, and particularly when they're Antarctic scientists and go away for several months a year. So just, yeah, uh, acknowledge you there. Um, so finally, last thank you. Um, we'll be going out the doors there to um, have some refreshments in the common room soon, but just uh, firstly just one more round of um, thanks and applause for Nick's talk. <laughs>